Okay, it's Mr. Benson here with a video for, of the solutions for the trial exam that you did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm going to try and work through the whole exam, so this will be quite long. Um, I'll break it up into uh, each area of study as a separate video, even though they will probably be quite long. So, um, starting off with motion. Now, remember though that when you are doing an exam, you shouldn't necessarily start with um, the first section. Use your reading time to figure out what you will do well, um, and then answer those things first. The other thing to be aware of that I think a few of you struggled with is um, how much time you allocate to each section. So don't go over time, um, because you're just going to miss out on marks in other sections. Remember that there will probably be some questions that you can answer in every section, so you do need to allow a bit of time for that. Okay, so moving down into the motion section now. I thought this was a fairly inconsistent exam. Some parts of it I thought were quite hard and some parts I thought were quite easy. So when we go down to the motion section, um, I thought that was actually fairly difficult. So the first question, uh, Melanie is out riding her bike. Um, she starts from rest. Um, so what we've got to think about here is the, the bits of information that are actually important. So when we um, come over here and start to look at, um, or start to think about what um, Melanie is doing in this question, so we need to think about the important bits of information. So starting from rest is an important information uh, piece of information. So we've got a driving force of 75 newtons. We've got a mass. Um, now, after travelling 500 metres, she's going at a constant speed, so that's an interesting point as well. The 500 metres may be important as well. Uh, the constant speed, well, maybe that'll be important um, somewhere later on. So there's a lot of information in this first paragraph. Now, down here, there is some more information that was important as well. Um, the forces resisting her motion are not constant and increase the faster she goes. The graph below shows the resistive forces acting on Melanie and her bike as a function of the distance travelled. Now that information is also important and comes in later on. So we have a look at the graph and we can see that we've got our time uh, sorry, our distance axis along the bottom and we've got our time axis um, at the top. So we can, uh, sorry, up the side, this is terrible, we're talking rubbish. Distance axis along the bottom, sorry, and our force axis on the, uh, the, the y axis here. So we can read forces um, off the graph if we need to. Okay, so going down to our first question. What is the resultant force acting on Melanie and the bike after she had ridden 500 meters? So this is a trick question, basically. It's worth one mark, so you obviously, and, and there's not a lot of room here to work anything out, so they're not expecting you to do a lot of calculations. The whole point of this is that after she's traveled 500 meters, she's going at a constant speed, which means that the net force, so resultant is basically just another word for net force, is zero newtons. Okay, so continuing on. What is the magnitude of Melanie's acceleration as she passes the 300 meter point? Show your working. So um, remember that we've got um, a graph here that we need to use. So when we look at the 300 meter point on the graph, we can see that there is a 50 newton um, resistive force. But we also know that from the um, initial information, there's a 75 newton thrust force. So the first thing we need to think about is what our net force is. So we're going to work our net force, which is going to be 75 newtons thrust minus 50 newtons. So we have a net force of 25 newtons uh, in the forward direction. Then our acceleration is just A equals F over M and we've got uh, a force of 25 newtons and we have a mass of 75 kilos and we get 0.33 meters per second squared sorry i don't know why that box just came up now remember as well when you're doing these that you should be writing your answers in the box make uh, life easier for the examiner don't make it hard um, they are not 
they're not paid enough to to spend a lot of time looking through your book trying to find an answer so make it easy for them now um at the 500 meter mark of her journey how much work has melanie done pedaling her bike now we've got um all we need to think about there is the fact that we know how much uh, force she has been applying so the force from melanie is 75 newtons now we know the displacement here and so it's just a case of w equals fx which is 75 times 500 and we get uh, three sorry 37,500 joules scrolling down at the 500 meter mark what is Melanie's kinetic energy now there are two ways to do this um, I like mine more but uh, that's that's fine now they t they've told you what her velocity is so this is the actually the simplest way of doing it but I'm not sure it's quite as accurate as some of the other ways so you know her velocity is 22.4 meters per second um, actually can I just well wow, that's really fast um, <laughs> okay so um, I never actually paid attention to that before but Melanie would be like an Olympic track cyclist to be going this speed um, so uh, we know that her V is 22.4 meters per second. Um, so one way of doing this is just go EK equals half MV squared. Uh, substitute that in and you get um, about 18 seven five oh joules or there it's pretty close to that the other way of doing it which is probably painful um, is to think about the amount of her work that has turned into heat um, because of the resistive forces so if we go um, work minus um, the area under the graph because the the graph is a force displacement graph so the area under it will be work but in the, it's not her work it's the work that um, well it is her work it's the work that she's done that has basically turned into heat um, the, so it's the work against the resistive forces of the of the bike um, so in that case if you were to work that out well the work is from our previous question 37500 the area under the graph turned out to be 18,750 and so that was just another way of getting 18,750 joules look I that was the answer I thought of first but obviously they're both uh, they're both ba correct based on information that's given in the question okay um, now if you've done it my way uh, in question D you've already worked out the answer to question E so question E the work has she done to overcome the resistive forces this equals the area under the graph and so what you needed to do was just go through the graph and divide it up into um, sensible figures that you can work out the area of so for example we can divide it up there so we've got a triangle there um, we've got a more roughly straight line going up there um, so we can get a parallelogram from that um, and then we can get another one up here whoops terrible line and a rectangle at the end um, or if you wanted to chop it up more you could um, Oh, I don't know why that line moved if you wanted to chop that up more we could do that and we could draw some horizontal lines there and there and, and that sort of thing um, okay so you do that work out the area under the graph which as I've mentioned before was um, 18750 joules and there's our answer okay at the 700 meter mark 
Melanie stops pedaling. She is still traveling on level ground. Which of the following best describes her motion? Now, this is something where we've got to think all the way back to the question at the beginning, and we've actually got to think quite carefully about it. Um, now, A would be true if there were no um, resistive forces on her, because she's no longer providing any thrust, but we know that there are some resistive forces. Um, now, and this is Newton's first law, so A would be correct if there were no resistive forces, but we know that there are, so A is wrong. B, she continues at a constant speed as given by Newton's second law. Well, that's wrong because that's not, not Newton's second law, so that's completely wrong. Um, now, here, this is interesting, C and D. She continues with constant negative acceleration until she stops, or D, she continues with non-constant negative acceleration until she stops. And this is where we need to think back to our original question, because the important thing that they tell us is that the forces resisting her motion are not constant and increase the faster she goes. So what that means is they'll also be not constant as she's slowing down. Um, and so C can't be correct either. The only one that could be correct in this case would be D. Okay, moving on to question two. So this is the truck on the way bridge. This is a horrible question. Um, it is not well written. Um, I guess a lot of people don't even know what a way bridge is. Um, I would suggest that the person who wrote the question doesn't know what a way bridge is either. Um, because usually a way bridge is used to weigh a whole vehicle and not just um, parts of it. So anyway, what they've said in this case is that it drives the front wheels onto a way bridge. Uh, it reads 1250 kilos. Um, it moves forwards until the back wheels are on the way bridge and it now reads 4,100 kilos. The truck drives forward again off the way bridge then stops on the road. So draw force arrows for all the forces acting on the truck as it is stopped on the road um, alongside give its value in newtons. Now it is a three mark question which suggests that there are three arrows needed. Now that depends a lot on how you've interpreted the question. Now, one interpretation um, is that there is um, 12,500 newtons of force downwards on the front tyre. Uh, one interpretation of the question is that there's 28,500 newtons down on the back tyre and this is if you're assuming that the 4,100 up here was actually the whole mass of the truck. Um, so I assumed this. Now other people assume different things and that's, look, it's fine because it wasn't a well-written question. The important part is you think about what the other forces are. And the, the only other force when it's stationary is the reaction force and they need to be equal and opposite forces. So if you did something like this, um, then that would be a reasonable answer and you would need, you'd get all your marks. If you combine some of the forces, so you had maybe one reaction force which was the total of the, the two forces, um, or you combine both the weight forces, that would be sensible as well, as long as the weight forces add up to a sensible number based on the question and they are balanced by the reaction forces. Um, the, where people went a bit wrong with this question was um, showing two reaction forces for instance and then also showing the the total reaction force but that means you're basically showing the same forces twice which doesn't make any sense okay so we get to a momentum question um, now this did trouble people a bit however um, I think this is a this was probably a fair question um, given that it's year 12 and things are a little bit more complicated. The tricky part here is that after the collision, both objects are moving. Um, and you actually, it's one of those questions where you, oh, you're not really working backwards, but you have to take all the information into account properly. So before the collision, only one object is moving. So the initial momentum is pretty easy. So the first thing you've got to think about here is P1, which is just 800, sorry this is a bit weird 800 times 3 so it is 2400 kilogram meters per second 
I'll draw a minus sign for me. There we go. Um, so that's pretty easy. The tricky bit though, and this is where people get confused, is you've got to remember that P2 is the P for the car plus P for the van after the collision. So they're not connected. And this is, I think, the thing that confuses people here is they are not combined. So um, in this case, you've got to treat them separately. But the maths is the same. So we know what P2 is because it's the same as P1. So we know that 2400 equals P car plus, now the van we know is 1500 and it was moving in two, at two meters per second in the same um, positive direction from the, um, the start of the question. So it's moving to the right. So what we find here when we rearrange this is that the momentum of the car is minus 600 kilogram meters per second. Um, and so we can work out the velocity, which is just P over M. So it is minus 600 over the mass of the car, which is 800. So we get minus 0 0.75 um, meters per second. Now, they say, what is the velocity? Now, this is important because they actually um, are, are looking for uh, the direction. So I think if you said it was minus 0.75 meters per second, that would be OK. Um, or the other thing I think you could say is that it was 0.75 meters per second uh, to the left. Either of those, I think, would be an acceptable answer. Okay, so moving on, um, showing that the collision was inelastic. So this is a classic kind of question. All you've got to show is the kinetic energies before and after the collision. Um, now, but again, the important thing to remember is that the kinetic energy after the collision is the kinetic energy of both vehicles. So kinetic energy one is just the kinetic energy of the car. So it's half of 800 times uh, 3 squared, so we get 3,600 joules. EK, sorry, I should say that that's EK1. EK2 is the kinetic energy of the car again. Now, in this case, it's going at 0.75 meters per second. Oh, sorry, I wish it would not start selecting stuff like that. Yeah, it's just going to annoy me. 0.75 meters per second, pretend there's a decimal point in there, squared, now you can ignore the negative sign because we're squaring it, plus the kinetic energy of the truck, um, which is a half of 1500 times 2 squared, and that gives us a total of 3225 joules. So it, we can say it's inelastic. Well, we know we're told that it's inelastic, but we can say it's inelastic as um, EK1 does not equal EK2. And then um, the meaning of inelastic is that the kinetic energy is not conserved. or words to that effect. You do have to be specific about kinetic energy um, because the energy is conserved, it just goes somewhere else. So um, it's important that you are talking about the kinetic energy there. Uh, now the car and the van are in contact for 22 milliseconds. What's the magnitude of the average force? So this is one of those questions where we're thinking about force equals impulse over time. Now, uh, we remember that the impulse is the change in momentum. Um, and we do actually know that um, for the, oh, this is so irritating. We do actually know that for the, um, the van, because the van started off with a velocity of zero. After the collision, it had a velocity of two. 
So its momentum or its change in momentum is 2 times 1500 or 3000 and we're dividing that by 22 um, milliseconds. And we get uh, uh, 140,000 newtons. And you could write 140 kilonewtons, that would be a, a nice uh, way of answering that. Okay, now question four. A traffic engineer is working out a theoretical maximum speed for a car to travel around a corner. So circular motion. Uh, we're told a radius, the maximum sideways force is 2,800 newtons, and we've got the mass of the car. What is the recommended theoretical cornering speed for this situation? So. We're just using um, the equations that we um, uh, probably can pull straight out of the formula sheet here. So the force is mv squared over r. Now we're trying to find v in this situation. Um, so m is up here, uh, force is there, and radius is there. So all we've got to do is substitute correctly. Now look, if... Um, I know that I always say that you should write down the quantities you know and things like that. Um, I would certainly suggest that when you're practicing, that's what you do. Um, it, when you get into the exam situation for questions like this, you're probably better just to highlight things or annotate the questions rather than rewriting the information because you are getting to the point where you really do need you to use your time well. Now, we need to be able to rearrange this one. This is probably the only tricky part of this question. Now, if you're not happy with rearranging stuff, then you need to either get happy with rearranging it very quickly, um, or you need to have the versions on your cheat sheet. So all we've got to do is sub in here. So we've got the force of 2800 newtons times the radius of 90 divided by a mass of 1200, and we're taking the square root of all that. And the answer that we get is 14.5 meters per second. I really don't know why this thing doesn't want to let me draw a dot. It gets all weird about it. There we go. Close enough. Okay, school athletics carnival uh, is our next question. So projectile motion, uh, motion in two dimensions. So what we've got to think about here is... Um, separating the information into components. Um, this question, if, if I remember correctly, caused quite a lot of confusion. I'll bet any of you $100 that you will get asked a question like this in the end of your exam. Maybe not exactly like this one, this was a little trickier, but you will get one of these projectile motion questions. Um, okay, so at the School Athletics Carnival, so James is competing in the shot put. He releases the shot at um, 8 metres per second at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal and the time of flight was 1.15. What's the horizontal distance travelled by the shot from the release point? Ignore air resistance. So what we've got to think about here is how fast was it travelling in the horizontal direction? Um, so the V, I should have said VX there. Um... V, I'll scribble that out, Vx uh, equals, so it's cosine to get the horizontal distance, so 8 cos 30, and we get 6.9 meters per second uh, is our horizontal velocity. Now all we've got to do here is just use the one of the simplest equations that we will use, um, Basically, it is just the velocity multiplied by the time because it's a constant velocity. So um, all you're doing is multiplying 6.9 times 1.15, and we get um, well 7.97, which is uh, well that's eight meters as our answer there, 8.0 meters. Where people get these questions wrong um, is when you're talking about horizontal, um, they either use the wrong velocity because they don't do they don't find the horizontal component, or 
they might get the right velocity, but for some reason they, th they think that acceleration's happening and they put the acceleration due to gravity into the equation somehow. Horiz in horizontal travel, there's no acceleration. We just assume that it's a constant velocity. And almost always, well, in fact, I, I would say always whenever there's a calculation involved, you ignore air resistance. You may get asked about what might happen if there was air resistance, but it would be a secondary question. Okay, what was the release height above ground? Ignore air resistance in this question. Now, there are a few ways you can answer this one. Um, you can treat it as um, as thinking about the um, uh, where the parabola is, if you like. Um, so when you have uh, sorry, that was an absolutely terrible explanation. You can think about it from that mathematical standpoint that we have we have an equation that describes the motion of the object and you can solve that equation. Um, I tend not to do that, to be honest. Um, what I'm inclined to do is to think about um, my questions like this in parts. So if we look up here, what I'm going to think about is, if I draw a line through there, um, I know that at this point here, um, I know that at that point there, this is when, sorry, that's meant to be the top, um, at that point there, V equals zero meters per second. So um, I can figure out how long it takes to go from the initial release point to the top. Now we know the total time of flight here because we know it's 1.15. So that means that I can figure out how much time it took to go all the way down to the bottom as well. So then we can um, start to figure out some other things as well in terms of distances and stuff like that. So the way I approach this question um, is the first thing you've got to think about is what is the uh, vertical component of the velocity. So that is 8 sine 30. Uh, which is uh, 4 meters per second. Oh, I hate this thing so much. Okay, so the first thing I did was I wanted to think about the time to the top, or if you want to sound like a massive physics nerd, the apogee is the highest point. Um, so that was just 4 over 10 because we're using 10 as our acceleration, so we get 0 0.4 seconds. Now, um, what that means um, is that the remaining time um, that it takes to fall is going to be 1.15 minus 0.4, which is going to be, I believe, 0.75 seconds. Okay, and so then what I thought is, okay, if it's 0.75 seconds to fall from the highest point, then I can calculate the height of the highest point. Um, it's going to be um, half AT squared when T is 0.75 seconds. And so that gave me a height of 2.8 um, 2.8 meters. Now, I know um, that um, what I can also figure out is how far it would fall in um, 0.4 of a uh, 0.4 seconds, which is the time it took to go um, from the release point up to the um, the apogee. Um, so I'll call this x total. So I could go x 0.4. Now same equation again. Um, there is there are other ways I could calculate this one, but I'm just going to do it this way um, because it's nice and simple. So again, it's half a uh, 0.4 squared and I get um, 0 0.8 meters 
for three marks this is a lot of work and this is another one of these questions where I, I don't think this exam was very fair um, and so what we get for our um, release height is 2.8 minus uh, 0 0.8 which is 2 meters now that's a sensible answer as well because if you think about it you've got someone standing with a shot put on their shoulder it's going to be somewhere between one and a half and two meters if they're a fairly tall person um, if you get an answer that's you know like 20 meters or something like that then it doesn't make sense and it's probably wrong okay now I was saying you might get asked an air resistance question um, so it's not a calculation but you need to think about the air resistance so when the air resistance is taken into account which of the following choices best shows the direction of the resultant force on the shot foot at the highest point okay so important stuff here when it's at its highest point the main force on it is gravity there's no thrust force on it at all so that doesn't make any sense this doesn't make any sense because the um, the force of the of gravity is always going to be more significant than the force of friction well almost always um, and so that doesn't make sense either so what have we got left B the force is straight down the only way that can happen is if the only force acting on it is gravity so B can't be right our only sensible answer is C where the vector here is the product of the gravity vector which would be vertically like that and a little friction vector which would be like that and write your answer in the box okay scrolling down question six apparent weight of an astronaut um, so the rocket is stationary on the launch pad so he's on earth so his apparent weight is mg so 750 newtons one mark pretty easy now it's ascending, ascending vertically with an acceleration of three so the way we work this out is the apparent weight is mg plus ma now um, in this case uh, so I'm going to say that the acceleration is a positive direction in this question um, so we're going to have uh, what, what's this guy 75 kilos times 10 is mg which is our answer from the first part plus 75 times 3 um, that's due to the acceleration due to the rocket moving um, and so we get 975 okay the rocket is in a stable orbit circling the earth at an altitude where the gravitation field is 8.4 now this is a trick question basically because what we've got to remember here is that when we're in a stable orbit we're basically falling around the planet so the centripetal force or the centripetal acceleration um, is at the is basically the same as the acceleration due to gravity so he will be experiencing in this case um, no force so apparent weightlessness um, because when we put these two terms in here um, so mg would be um, 75 times 8.4 that's mg plus 75 now I'm going to say in this case minus 8.4 because whereas in the previous question he was accelerating 3 meters per second squared upwards when you're in orbit you're basically falling downwards so his acceleration is um, minus 8.4 so these two terms cancel each other out and we get 0 newtons okay satellite at mass of um, um, 275 kilos is circling the earth with a period of 105 minutes what is meant by the term stable orbit as used in this situation uh, look I think there are a few, a few ways you could express this one um, people talked about um, a constant radius um, the other way that I think is worth thinking about here is that the centripetal acceleration um, is the or, or sorry the centripetal force is the force um, of gravity on the object um, that's another way of explaining that I think so either of those is fine so what's the altitude of the satellite 
Now, this is where we've got to go back to um, our favorite equation that's not in the formula sheet. And we've just got to substitute, uh, rearrange this and sub into it. So R equals a cube root of uh, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So that's G times, now we're talking the mass of the Earth here, 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Um, now then we've got the period squared. Whoops. Sorry, we're still still meant to be under our um, cube root sign here. So remember that you are working in seconds always, not um, minutes. So it's 105 times 60, and all of that is squared. And then that is divided by 4 pi squared. Excuse my messiness here, but um, you'll probably get the idea. Okay, so then we get a radius of 7376220 meters. But the question is saying, what is the altitude? So the answer is 7376220 minus the radius of the Earth, which is also on the formula sheet. And we get uh, an answer of 2... Um, Sorry, 1 by 10 to the 6 meters. Can I delete that? Nope. Okay. I really need to learn how to use this better. 1 by 10 to the 6 meters is our, um, is our altitude there. What is the speed of the satellite in this stable orbit? Now, all we've got to think about here is just V equals 2 pi r. That is the circumference of the orbit divided by the period. Now we're told what the period is earlier on. Um, we've just figured out what the radius is. So 2 pi 7374220 over 105 times 60. And we get 7400 meters per second. Okay, so that's done for motion. Um, I know that's a fairly epic video. I will also um, put the uh, annotated um, PDF up online so you can have a look at that. And I'll keep working through these, the rest of these sections as well.